Tonight is a celebration of the internet's entrepreneurs and, and innovators, and we're very fortunate to be joined by Brad Burnham, who knows a thing or two about the subject. Aldous Huxley once said that at first appearance, innovators have generally been persecuted and always derided as fools and madmen. But where some see madmen, others like Brad see opportunity. And Brad formed Union Square Ventures, a venture capital firm, with Fred Wilson in 2003 to invest in what they describe. I love this because it's so dry. The highly networked communities of users at the application layer of the web, snore. Um, Brad has said all the firm's ventures celebrate and depend on human connection. And with a portfolio that includes Twitter, Tumblr, Meetup, Zynga, Foursquare, Kickstarter, I took about 10 others out, to name a few, it's easy to see why he is viewed as a rock star, that was the word that, was, that, that comes up, to a generation of young entrepreneurs and innovators. Washington is a world away from the daily business concerns of investors, but Brad is uniquely gets that policy matters to innovation and that the policy that matters most is the preservation of the open internet. He's committed to getting it right and showing up when it matters. He was a driving force in bringing the VCs into the SOPA PIPA fight and was an eloquent advocate and strategist for that effort. Please join me in welcoming Brad Burnham. Leslie, thank you. She was right, I can't see anybody out there, so I, I'm not nearly as intimidated as I thought I was gonna be. <laughs> I am honored, but also a little surprised to be here. I started working in technology 30 years ago, and for most of that time, thought the work that I did had very little to do with policy. Back then, I was either building or, invent, uh, or investing in technology infrastructure that became the foundation for the internet. In the last several years, however, the investment opportunity has shifted from infrastructure to the applications and services that ride on that infrastructure. All of a sudden, every policy decision made in Washington impacts our work. Many impinge on what I believe is a core freedom, the freedom to innovate. I want to spend a few minutes tonight sharing my view of how that happened and what it means to our economy and to our society going forward. At Union Square Ventures, we invest in networks. We were the first institutional investors in Twitter, Tumblr, Foursquare, Leslie mentioned all these, Etsy, Kickstarter. Um, we have also invested in many other less familiar networks in markets like education, employment, and finance. As we spend time with these networks, we learn more and more about their extraordinary economics. They are easy to bootstrap, create remarkable efficiencies, optimize the value of scarce resources, and cost very little to promote. Like most of these networks, Foursquare was built on an open source software stack, and its services are delivered over the internet. They were able to grow to over 100,000 users on less than $25,000. Craigslist radically reduced the cost of classified advertising. They replaced call centers and printing presses and trucks and trees that used to be necessary to alert the world that you wanted to sell your couch. <laughs> With an iPhone photo and a drop-dead simple electronic post. Airbnb has, invented the way, has, has reinvented the way travelers are matched with beds. And in the process, they have enabled hundreds of thousands of people around the world to capture the value in their spare bedroom. Twitter, Tumblr, and Foursquare spend little or nothing to acquire new users or to propagate a new feature. We hear a lot about viral marketing, but I did not internalize its implications until I watched David Karp, the founder of Tumblr, introduce a new feature by hiding it. When I was an entrepreneur in the software business, we spent a ton of money and time to introduce a new feature. 
We did analyst tours, issued press releases through parties, bought billboards to promote that feature. David hides it. But then he sends an email to a few popular bloggers and tells them, if they mouse over this one section of the site, there will be a drop down and they can see a few capabilities. Play with them, tell me what you think, but don't tell too many people because I'm not committed to releasing it. <laughs> Two weeks later, there's a kid in Akron, Ohio telling the kid down the street, I'm not supposed to tell you this, <laughs> but if you mouse over this one section of the site and the feature is now ubiquitous. These economics create enormous opportunity. The combination of low cost, cheap capital, and relatively free access to markets has created an unprecedented era of decentralized, emergent startup innovation. By creating novel new services and dramatically reducing the cost of existing services, that innovation has unlocked value for consumers. But at the same time, the process, the classic creative destruction of free market capitalism has created new challenges for, for incumbent industrial hierarchies. For the last 130 years, the economy has been dominated by firms structured as bureaucratic hierarchies. That model worked well to mass produce products for mass consumption. But the inefficiency of communicating customer needs up through the hierarchy and management decisions back down and the natural tendency of any organization to protect its current structure makes it difficult, if not impossible, for hierarchies to innovate as quickly as the emerging network-based model of decentralized innovation. So the incumbents, who have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to maximize profits, look for ways to stave off competition from networks and protect their current cost structures. Increasingly, they ask policymakers and regulators to change the rules in ways that tilt the market in their favor. Policymakers and regulators who have long-standing relationships with these incumbents are receptive to these requests because they are usually couched in language about the safety or security of consumers. And because there are only a few people, most of them are in this room, who are explaining the risks of these proposed policies and regulations. Over the next few years, there will be a steady stream of these requests. The hotel lobby in the city of New York has already convinced the city council to outlaw temporary hotels. The bill was presented as a consumer safety measure to prevent slumlords from turning dilapidated tenements into squalid, unsafe hotels. The council members never considered the bill's impact on Airbnb, but the hotel lobby knew exactly what the proposed language meant. The Research Works Act played out in a very similar way here in Washington. Its original sponsors understood it as the elimination of a government mandate that forced researchers to embrace a specific business model. The academic publishers who sponsored the bill knew very well that it would slow competition from op open access journals. I could go on and on. Telecom companies asking regulators to impose new burdens on Skype or toy manufacturers asking regulators to force Etsy sellers who make hand-carved wooden toys to be set, subjected to a rigorous certification process that only makes sense for large manufacturers. The point is that we have to step back and see these policy proposals as the inevitable byproduct of the transformation of our economy. We have to see them as part of the competition be between the bureaucratic hierarchical model for the creation of economic value and the new emergent economics of networks. We need to be smart enough to recognize that it's not consumers asking for these regulatory or legal restrictions, it's the incumbents. We need to defend the freedom to innovate because it is critical to the health of our economy. Our economy is today one of the most innovative and friendly, innovation of friendly economies in the world. Until recently, no one investing in or creating a business on the internet would have considered building their business anywhere else. But the recent enforcement actions against Mega Upload and JotForm have forced entrepreneurs and investors in internet services to rethink where their businesses are based. I don't know the particulars of the JotForm case, and it is very hard to defend the behavior of the Mega Upload founders. But it is also impossible to ignore the fact that the site takedowns made it impossible 
for hundreds of thousands of people to get to completely legitimate content that they had stored on those sites. In the weeks that followed those takedowns, every one of our portfolio companies had to reconsider where their users' data is stored. All of them are now wondering if they should be moving to a domain name server outside this country. The internet is a global network. There are countries out there that recognize the opportunity to create an internet enterprise zone. They are working to establish a policy framework that protects users' data and more broadly, the freedom to innovate. I cannot tell you when or even if data and the good systems administration jobs that go with it will move offshore, but I can tell you that that conversation has already started. But networks are not just critical to our economy. They are critical to a, vi to a vital civil society. It is pretty clear that we will not have the ability to continue to live in the manner to which we become accustomed. We are very likely not going to be able to support things we value, like the arts and social services, in the way that we'd like. We are going to have to learn to do more with less. Networks can play a role here, too. Kickstarter, a crowdfunding network, launched only a few years ago, will provide more support for the arts this year than the National Endowment. In the UK, lawmakers are just as frustrated as we are that banks are still not lending to small businesses. But they have a regulatory framework that allowed Funding Circle, a peer-to-peer -peer network of lenders and borrowers, to flourish. Lawmakers have now begun encouraging their constituents not just to shop local and eat local, but to lend local. They're, they're asking them, they, by asking them to lend local, they have created a brand new source of working capital for small businesses and an emotional and financial return for lenders. There are many, many other examples of networks making a difference, difference in civil society, from mapping slums in Kenya, to getting at-risk kids in New York to take better care of their health, to empowering mothers in Boston to take on gang violence. If we defend the freedom to innovate, we will find lots of ways to efficiently deliver important social benefits. Of course, we should expect the same resistance from the incumbent bureaucracies in the public sector who regard these services as their turf. Innovation depends on keeping the cost of innovation down, making sure that financing is available, and making sure that markets are accessible. It does not depend on R&D grants or targeted industrial policy. So the, next time, so the next time you see a piece of legislation that has an impact on an open internet, software or business method patents, copyright enforcement, free and fair competition, open government, or cybersecurity, I urge you to see it through the lens of the competition between incumbent industrial hierarchies and emergent networks. Consider who is sponsoring the legisla legislation. Does it really protect consumers, or does it protect the business models and cost structures of the incumbents? I recently heard a woman from the Occupy movement say the most poignant thing. She said, no one is coming for us. Her generation does not expect the government to be there when they need it, nor do they think that incumbent industrial hierarchies are structured or motivated to solve the challenges that they expect to face. Remarkably, she was not depressed, defeated, or bitter. She was determined. The kids who grew up inside AOL chat rooms and came of age on Facebook have an intu intuitive understanding of the power of networks that our generation will never have. They are not asking us to fix the problems we have left them with. They are asking us not to get in their way as they try and dig themselves out. I think we owe them that. Thank you.